Yeah, so you have, so you can only talk about this martingale um, when, when you're dividing by something which is finite, that's the m theta. So you have theta 1, theta 2, embedded in that is theta lower star, theta upper star. So the martingale goes to 0 here. Okay, and, and in, in the open interval, it has a good limit. And the, and the derivative martingale goes to 0 inside, but has a good, a good limit precisely on the boundary. And things are not properly resolved, I don't think, here. They could indeed, yeah. They could indeed, yeah. Um, no, he didn't. No, <laughs> that's right. He did this first. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's a there's a much quicker proof. Um, it falls out of this with a, some slick, some rather slick reasoning. You can. Um, and you can or you can already get. Uh, I think the lower bound is very easy, right? So you, if you if you look at. If you look at the martingale just a little bit to the left, <coughs> just here, just, just inside the good interval, then, well, one of the summands is, is the rightmost, contains, has the rightmost particle as its value for the xin, so m. Okay, um, so if you if we log that, okay, so log or minus log it, uh, and then divide by what do we need to do? We need to uh, I'll put a theta here, and I will put a, so I've done log and then minus, so minus log, is it plus? Yeah, it's plus. So I'm cheating a bit here. That's All right, so that has a nice limit. So if you take the, the limb in for that thing, well, that's, that's OK. That's good. That thing is good. That's nice. And uh, uh, this thing doesn't depend on n. OK? So on the survival set, the limit is, on the survival set, the limit is strictly positive. Um, so the, 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 I, mean, I don't want to go into the details, but roughly speaking, you can get rid of this term here. I think I need to divide by, no, I need to divide by n. That's it, I've forgotten about that. When you take the limit, that thing's good, and the n kills it. So the n gets rid of it. And then you're left with this, and then, of course, you use continuity and take epsilon to, to 0. OK, the, the upper bound's a little bit more tricky. Okay, so let, let's pick it up with, um, so I'm trying to get through as many processes as I think you, as I think you will hear about this afternoon. So this is uh, for Christina and, and Matthias. Okay, so now let's move on to these fragmentation chains. And so fragmentation chains, they, they pick up from this, from this process here, from crump mode Jaeger's processes. Um, so, 
So imagine you took an interval 0, 1, and you were going to start breaking it randomly into little bits, right? So <coughs> like this, you chop it into little pieces. So if you, you could think of this as, these as masses, right? The lengths are a sense, this has got, the length of this is 1, so think of this object as having unit mass, and then the lengths of these partitions are essentially masses as well. Okay, so we break the unit mass into submasses. So I could do that randomly, so it means I've got uh, some subintervals, some smaller pieces, b1, b2. If I order them, I'll always order them in size, so I can reshuffle this so that I always have the, the biggest bit first, and then the next biggest, next biggest, next biggest, and so on. And um, let's say we've got some random way of, of, of chopping this unit interval up. Um, we'll call that, we'll call the bits B1 and so on. The length adds up to 1, obviously. So <coughs> now at this point, I, I hope my notation is, is OK. So I'm going to use this as a kind of, in the same way I use the point process to evolve a branching process, in the same way I use this offspring distribution A to evolve a Galton Watson process. I'm going to use this as my fundamental data, if you like, to, to grow a fragmenting process, which is in essence a branching process. Okay, so if I have an interval, which is a fragment of something that I've doing, been doing previously, then I can fragment that piece even further by independently sampling from, um, from this distribution. And my notation is bad. So if this interval has length mod i, then if I take my independent sample of this partition b1, b2, this ordered partition, then, and I multiply by the length of i, then I've just taken a scaled down version of, of this independent sample. And so what I could do is suppose I iteratively do this. So I, I, in, the, in the spirit of branching processes, I take my unit interval. I, I partition it with subintervals. Okay? And then that's generation 1. So generation 0 would be the unit interval. And then what I do is I take the, the scaled-down version of independent samples of these, these, uh, these, this partition, this random partition, and then I apply it independently, one uh, partitioning here, another partitioning here, another partitioning here. Okay? So I would then, and then I reorder the masses in decreasing size. Then I would get a new, so initially I would have to partition independently this, this length here, and then independently partition this length, and so on. And then I would need to, to, to reorder it in decreasing order. So I'd have dong, 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 dong. OK? So if I did that to the nth generation, and I'm using these, these words obviously in, in an obvious sense now, if I did that to the nth generation, OK, then I took minus log of the inter interval lengths, okay? So I'm being a little bit naughty here because I'm using i both as intervals and the lengths of the intervals here, of notation. Okay, so maybe I should have a mod, mod i here, but if you bear with me, so what, if I take the, the negative log of the, the interval lengths after n generations of this independently splitting each fragment size that I see in the previous generation, okay, then this is a CMJ process. This is a crump mode jagers process. Why? Because, well, let's pull up the picture. Everything's in the picture. So what's, what have I got here? Actually, I think I have another picture over here. No. What have I got here? Well, if I take the first uh, partitioning, if I take the lengths of the first partitioning, so they would be log b1 minus log b2, and, and so on. 
Now, of course, because I've partitioned the unit interval, then, then each of these things is a number between 0 and 1. So, so minus log of each of these things is a, a, a positive number, right? And because I've ordered them, so I have um, the lengths b1 is the biggest, b2 is the next biggest, and so on. And, and let's just assume that we've got strict ordering. I, I, I have a random distribution which, strictly, which always produces a strictly ordered um, sample. Um, then I've got, uh, I've got an or <coughs> well, then I've got an ordered sequence of real numbers when I take minus log of them. Okay. So the largest, the largest block, the length of the largest block is the smallest value, the, the smallest cross in the point process here. Okay, so largest block, next largest block, next largest block, okay? And then what about the, the size of blocks in the next generation? Well, I take each of these blocks and then I subdivide them again and then I reorder them. So when I subdivide them, remember if I, if I ha had a particular fragment I, so when I subdivide it, what I'm doing is I'm taking the length of I and, and then multiplying that by an independent sample from this partition, this random partition distribution. So, of course, it means that the resulting fragments have length mod the, the, the fragment, that, the, the, piece that, the length of the piece I've just broken up times by the relative lengths of the, the subfragments. Okay? So on the, on the log scale... That would give me um, uh, for example, the, the, the first block would be this size, right? I've done something wrong. Better? Yeah? Okay. So the effect of when I, when I partition, I, multi, I, I multiply by factors the, the length of the subfragments by the, the length of the parent fragment. Okay, that corresponds to adding relative to this position here, right, in the CMJ. Okay. So multiplication becomes adding on the minus log scale. So if I want to know how small are the subfragments of this particular sub this particular fragment here well i need to multiply the length of this fragment by the sampled subfragments okay the, 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 by the, the 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 sample lengths of these uh, b1s b2s and so on so that corresponds to adding from that value adding an uh, an iid um, point process, okay. and the point process having points being minus log b1, minus log b2, and so on. And everything is ordered. Okay, so the CMJ process is representing, or rather, this is representing a CMJ process. This is a CMJ process. Okay, so... <coughs> I can, rather than talking about a scattering of uh, positions in the nth generation, but those positions in the CMJ happen to be birth times, okay, so the scattering of the point process, which is the nth generation, is a scattering on the positive half line of uh, a, what amount to birth times in the CMJ. So instead of talking about uh, a point process, of birth times, I can just talk about, well, a point process of minus log fragment size lengths or just a sequence of ordered um, masses, if you like. Okay, so this is, this is what we can think of the fragmentation chain. 
how it's valued at generation n. Okay? Now, we want to move this into real time. So this is where it gets really confusing. So the CMJ process was motivated by the branching random walk. But when we took space for the branching random walk to mean time, to mean real time. But now I've converted this axis to minus log fragment length. Okay? And I want to convert this axis to real time. Okay, so this axis was generation number and real time. This has been converted to minus log of fragment length. And upwards I want to go into real time. So what I'm going to do is instead of just looking at generations of dislocations, I want to hold a particular fragment as it is for an independent and exponentially distributed random time. Okay? So we start with the unit interval. The unit interval has length 1. <coughs> minus log of that is 0. Okay? So on this axis, we've got minus log fragment length. So I've got the unit interval, and I hold it for an independent and exponentially distributed random time. It fragments. It fragments using a sample of this, these subintervals, b1, b2, b3, and so on. So the minus log of these guys is the scattering here, the point process scattering. It's the ordered minus log interval length of the first fragmentation that occurs. Now, this guy, that's the largest block, Each of th this guy, like every one of them, is assigned another independent and exponential clock. Okay, so the next action that occurs with the largest block here after the first fragmentation is happening after an independent and exponentially distributed time, and there it is. Okay, so these are the minus log relative fragment lengths relative to the size of the first block in the first dislocation. Okay? Now, of course, that can happen later than perhaps one of its siblings here. So one of these other blocks here, because they all have independent clocks on them, one of these guys could fragment first before the, the, the largest block. There's no reason to have this block fragmenting first, right? So each of them have an independent clock. So we don't know which one of them will go first. In the picture I've drawn here, uh, this guy seems to be the one, at least the part of the picture that we see, right? This is the one that went first, okay? So this process here is describing the state of my unit interval after real time t as it's fragmented according to independent clocks associated to each fragment bit, okay? So after some time t, well, if I didn't order in large, in, in, in order of size here, then we, maybe this guy hasn't yet fragmented, maybe this guy has fragmented, maybe this one hasn't, this one hasn't, maybe this one has, okay? So if I look at time t, I draw this red line here and I look at time t, then in this diagram here, what I'm picking up, what intersects the red line, are uh, the, the current state of the size of the blocks, irrespective of how many fragmentations have occurred. Okay? And as you see in the picture here, even if this one has fragmented and this one haven't, hasn't, it doesn't matter if we just look at the, 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 the lengths and we add them up, they still add up to one. Okay? So take time t. What I see is a point process moving across the red line, and this point process is telling me what the relative si what the, the, the current size of all of the, the lengths of all of the current fragments are at time t. In fact, it's even doing better than that. It's even telling me, telling me them in order, right? Remember? It's on the minus log scale, so small is big. So this would be the biggest fragment, the next biggest, and so on. Now, it happens in this picture 
that the biggest fragment comes from the biggest fragment of the initial fragmentation, right? <coughs> uh, but you could imagine a scenario where that was not true. Right? So that would be that would be a case where I would have some a picture like like this. So we could have a picture looking like this. So we fragment, okay. And this guy is very early to fragment, but then his offspring is very late in fragmenting all the bits. But this guy fragments, say, here, maybe. Okay, so the time t, the, the largest block is an offspring of the second largest block of the first, of the initial fragmentation. Okay. So there's all sorts of complicated things you can read out of this. And again, so I, I just think of what I've got as an ordered, so if I, I then exponentiate this, I, e to the minus that, I can think of my process at time t as uh, a process of ordered lengths or mass partitions of 0, 1. So in, this, in particular, the sum of these lengths will add up to 1. Okay, so that's your fragmentation chain. For Christina, who's going to speak this afternoon, so we can also talk about self-similar fragmentation chains. So self-similar fragmentation chains have the property that um, if a fragment has a particular size s, then rather than giving everybody an independent clock, which is exponential with the same rate, I'll change the rate according to the size of the fragment. Okay? So... At some time t, I see the system looking like this. Then this guy has size s. Well, he shouldn't look, yeah, he should look like that. He has size s, so I'm going to attach the life length to this guy being exponential with, or let's say this is just, for, this is just after a fragmentation. I attach to this guy an, a life length, which is ex exponential s to the alpha, well, multiplied by some parameter, which I'll take as 1. Okay, and now this, this index alpha, this real number alpha, is, is the index of self-similarity. So the case alpha is zero is the case where I have them all waiting around with the same rate, an independent exponential with a constant rate. But when alpha is not zero, then I've, I'm, I'm fragmenting at rates which depend on the size of the block. And actually, it, it turns out that... If you take an alpha which is not zero, then if I start the process from one piece of length one, so this is what I mean by that, I start with one piece of length one, um, and then I run the process to a certain time, which is, well, t with a scaling of c to the alpha t. c is any constant between zero and one. So I scale time, and I scale length like this, okay, then that scaling of the process it, remember it was the collection of fragment lengths that I see at time t, so if I perform that scaling on that vector, i1, i2, okay, then what I see is a copy of the process again, okay, but with starting from an object which has initial length c. Okay, so I take any constant c between 0 and 1. If I'm branching, if I'm, I'm dislocating with everybody having a, an independent exponential clock whose rate depends on the size, of their, the, the size of their being, then we have this scaling effect. Okay, and it, this is why it's called the self-similar fragmentation process. Okay, and there's also a Markov property to be found here. Okay, and the Markov property is saying, well, if I want to move from time t 
sorry, from time, uh, I'll be careful, I always mess this up. Well, okay, from time t to time t plus s, then what I need to do is take the fragments I see at time t. Okay, so imagine the system looks like this at time t. And then out of each of these fragments, okay, I need to grow an independent process. And the independent process I'm going to choose to grow are independent copies of scaled versions of the original process. Okay, so here, suppose the length here is C1, the next length is C2, so this is the state of the, the partition at time t. So given the state of the partition looks like that at time t, then how do I progress to time t plus s? Well, I take what I'm given and I grow out of that independent copies of rescaled versions of this IT, rescaled in space and time. Okay, so I'm observing this statement here. Okay, so the rescaled versions behave like the, the original fragmentation process as though it's evolving from a piece of size C. Okay, so that's why I, I scale in space and time to get a piece of size, in this case C1, and then I let that grow for S units of time. And that's independent of what I do with this fragmentation and this fragmentation and this fragmentation, this fragment, okay? So in that sense, you have a, a branching property, okay? And a Markov property as well. The independence is the branching and the, and the Markov is that all I need from the history is what the state of play is at time t. Okay, I'm going to skip this slide, fragmentation processes. So, well, there's not much to say. A fragmentation process would simply um, take this as its definition, or a self-similar fragment would take this as its definition. A Markov process living in the space of partition lengths of the unit interval, which has that property, which has that Markov and branching property. Okay, now, of course, the description I've given you here fits that definition, but there's more in there. So in, in essence, what, what more is there in there? So I can have my actions occurring. So here I've kind of got finite activity, right? I have to hang around for a, for a long time to wait and see anything happen here for any of these pieces. But there is a way of defining these processes so that Given any one block, you, you see a, a dense set of action times over, over all, you take positive time, and you, you can have a dense set of action times. So essentially the process, at ev almost every time, or, or a dense set of, a countable dense set of times, fragmentations are occurring, right, all the time. So this is a rather finite system that you can find, or a finite activity system, that you can find within the class of processes that do that. Fragmentation processes are the infinite activity version of that. And in fact, what I've said here, that fragmentation chains are to fragmentation processes what compound Poisson, Poisson processes are to Levy processes. Okay, if you know what those quantities are, what those things are. Okay, now, let me take, let me move on, and I'll come back to where we started Galton Watson processes, but I want to take this idea of rather than counting, looking at time through generations, introducing a sense of real time by putting holding times on individuals, exponential holding times. So in other words, I want to move from the Galton Watson process as a discrete time Markov chain to the Galton Watson process as a continuous time Markov chain. If you remember from your Markov chain course, one way to convert a, a discrete time Markov chain to a continuous time Markov chain is to put exponential holding times on each state, okay? So it's something like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that um, each individual is going to hang around for an independent exponential amount of time with rate beta, okay? And then it'll branch, and then it'll divide up into a random number of offspring. 
Okay, and so now zt is the number of individuals at time t. So before we had zn, okay, that was the number of individuals in generation n. But now when I'm holding individu individuals for a real amount of time before I let them fragment, so one picture I might draw one way of representing that. So we could say, hang on for an exponential, do your split, okay, do your split into random offspring. And then each one with an independent exponential amount of time will hang around again for an exponential amount of time and split and so on. Now the tree becomes a bit difficult to draw because, uh, as I said before, there's no, there's no meaning of, of space in this axis. So I just have to make sure that things don't overlap to see what's going on here. So we get different holding times for different children and so on. Okay, so I'm just drawing it so that... Uh, Everything fits in the picture, right? And then we look at time t. We take, whoop. this is time. So I look at time t, and I see how many people I've got at that time. Okay, I just count them up, and that's zt. And again, I can put this little k up to tell me uh, whether I'm interested in having just one individual at time 0 or k individuals. And exactly as before, so we have this branching decomposition that if I'm, I want to know what's happening at time t from k individuals, all I need to do is grow k trees, each starting from one individual, independent of one another, and look at the relative contributions at time t and add them together. Okay? Okay, and again, we have the same Markov property occurring. So if I want to get from time uh, t to time s, just tell me how many you've got at time t, okay? And then from each one, let's grow an independent copy of the original thing out of that and then intersect a further s units of times later and count up the aggregate of what we've got, okay? The, in this case, uh, there is something a little subtle here. So we, we are using the lack of memory property. So I say glue on an independent copy of this process. Well. That's okay on generations, but here I'm halfway through a lifetime. I'm, I'm halfway through somebody's life, or two-thirds of the way through somebody's life. I've interrupted it, and then I'm saying, well, to get from here to here, forget what was there. I'll just glue on an independent copy of this tree, and apparently the, con the aggregate of what I see when I glue on independent copies to each of these guys is the same in law as, or the same distribution as what I should see at time t plus s. So, what about the fact that I've inter interrupted here? I mean, this should still, if I forget the past and I look at just this guy, I should still see an, an exponential holding time to my first branching point because that's what I told you here. So the, the process started off with the first guy holding for an exponential and then branching. Well, that's the lack of memory property. Okay, so the lack of memory property allows me to say what I'm saying here that what I see at time t plus s is, in effect, in effect, forget the past, just see what you've got here, and then start afresh with an independent copy, run for a time s, attach to each one, and then take the aggregate at time, time s later. Okay. Now, lots of familiar properties, so I'm not going to go through all this because it's just saying the same thing again, but repeating uh, t instead of s, uh, instead of n, okay, so extinction is now zero for some time, process becomes zero at some time, if the mean is less than or equal to one, of course, then you extinct with probability one, if the mean is strictly bigger than one, then you have a chance of survival, okay, and on survival you go to infinity, well, if we look at starting with one guy, we look at the average number of offspring, that's a little bit more complicated now because before I, I could, well, I didn't show you that, but there's an, there's an obvious way of iterating over generations. You can do an a law by induction, a uh, uh, proof by induction. Here we kind of come in at time t. Everybody's staggered. Everybody's got a staggered birth time relative to time t. Okay? So there's not a, an argument by induction that I can use as I would use with generational counts. But nonetheless, we find that the mean number that I have at time t is exponential. That should be a beta. Exponential with the branching rate that everybody gets, beta. 
and then mean number of offspring minus one. Okay? Take, so that's the mean number of people at time t, take the actual number of people at time t, divide by the mean, there's your martingale again, and you can imagine what the, the analogue of the Kester-Stegen theorem looks like. Okay, now, there's something very nice uh, about continuous time golden Watson processes in that I can somehow find other processes hidden inside of them, and I can find compound Poisson processes hidden inside of them. And the way to access that compound Poisson process is to do a time change. So now I'm going to construct a clock. Okay, so the clock is, well, the integral up to time t of the process itself. All right? So in some sense, um, the larger z is, the more people you've got, the faster the clock is ticking. Right? And this is the inverse of that clock. So it says, how much, uh, how much real time do I need to get this clock up to time t? Now, I will time change my branching, my continuous state golden Watson process by the inverse of that clock. Right? So when I time change the branching process in this way, what comes out here, I claim, is a compound Poisson process. Right. Now let's just look at how this thing behaves up to the first branching time. So T1 I'm calling the first branching time. So that would be here. Um, I'll start with K individuals. All right? Let's start with K guys. So let's make the picture even worse. Okay, here are the K guys. The offspring. K is 3. When, what's the distribution of T1? Well, each of these K guys has got an exponential clock, independent. So the first action I see occurs after an independent amount of time, uh, sorry, uh, occurs after an amount of time which is the minimum of K independent exponential distributions. And the minimum of K independent exponential distributions is again exponentially distributed. Okay? It's exponentially distributed with the sum of the rates. And they all have the same rate which is beta. So the first action time is exponentially distributed with rate k beta. And so what's this clock doing? Well, this is just k up until that first action time. So j at time t1 is just k times t1 because nothing has changed in the value of z. It's still k people up to t1. Okay. And since T1 is exponentially distributed, another property of exponential distributions, if you multiply an exponential by a constant, you again get an exponential distribution. And you get an exponential distribution with the parameter multiplied by 1 over that constant. So that guy's already exponentially k beta. Multiplying by k means this is exponential with that thing divided by that constant, which is beta. Okay, so the value of this clock at the first action time is now exponentially distributed with parameter beta. Okay, so what's happening at time t1 is somebody, I don't know which one, but somebody has, has, has branched. Okay, and the number of individuals has moved from k to k plus i with probability pi i. Now, pi i is basically an adjustment of the offspring distribution pi. Okay? So, pi i is the distribution of the, the number of offspring minus 1. I've just shifted the index. So, I move from whatever I had to 
whatever I had plus i, which might be minus 1 if there are zero offspring, with that probability rather than probability pi. <coughs> OK? Now, so if you think about this, then um, if I can convince you of what's going on up to the, the first action time, then because there's, there's a Markov property here, then that's enough to tell you what's happening for the rest of the process. Because, I mean, after this action has occurred, then we just repeat, right? We come into the process at some time, and that process has a different number of offspring. And when we next look to the next action time, it's again an exponential distribution, which is the minimum of a number of exponentials, just with a different value for k. OK? So what has happened is, in effect, I have converted by, by what the effect of this inverse is doing, the inverse of this clock, is I have converted the, the first action time from uh, an exponential with k beta to an exponential with beta. And that's independent of the k, right? So if, in effect, under the time change, I have caused my first action to occur after an independent exponential with rate beta, I change the number of particles, then again I forget the pass by the Markov property, the next action time will again, through the time change, still occur with an exponential with rate beta, which is independent of the previous exponential. Okay? So in effect, this, this thing here is observing things, is observing changes every independent and exponentially distributed random time. And what is happening is how much am I changing by on each action? I'm changing by an adjustment to the number of particles by adding i with this distribution, right? So the spacing of the actions is iid, an exponential, and the actual action itself is again an independent and identically distributed change by adding a constant number of particles or subtracting one. It depends on uh, the i, the value of i, okay? So what does that? What hangs around for an exponential and then jumps to a new position and then hangs around for another exponential and then takes another jump of the same distribution somewhere else and then hangs around for another exponential and then takes another jump with the same independent sample from the same distribution. Goes, so that's a compound Poisson process. Okay? So what we've done is the time change has, has, has lengthened out and it's shrunk and it's contracted and, and, and lengthened the periods of times between individual changes in the number of offspring so that what we're observing in the end is starting with k, exponential holding time, and then we increase by a random number or we decrease by one. Either we have no offspring or we increase the number of uh, people. So we go up, okay, and then we hang around for an exponential amount of time. And again, there's a change here. The change is the number of offspring or minus one if, if we have no offspring. So it's, again, it's an IID uh, copy of the, the discontinuity here. Okay, let's say it's minus one and so on. So we're seeing here a compound Poisson process in the end. And you can also do the reverse. You can say, you give me a compound Poisson process with a rival rate Q and a jump distribution which is concentrated on minus one, zero when not allowed, uh, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, with probabilities, uh, there's, there's an i missing there, pi one, pi two, pi three, and so on. Okay, if I take that compound Poisson process and I time change it through the obvious inverse version of the time change that I saw on the previous slide, I need to stop it, however, if it ever comes to zero, I mean, it might be the case that we have a sequence of, uh, of down steps which bring us down to zero here. I need to stop that compound Poisson process on hitting the origin. So by time changing up to the compound Poisson process hitting the origin, the process that comes out, well, it turns out to be 
a continuous time Galton Watson process because I've reintroduced, right, I've reintroduced an inhomogeneous waiting time for change, okay, and it's state dependent. The, 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 the time I hang around before changes is depending on the current value, okay, and the dependency that's introduced is exactly the same dependency that you see in the continuous time Galton Watson process. Okay. Now that motivates the continuous state branching process. So here, the Galton Watson process in real time Z T, it's integer valued. Okay? And so we somehow mapped this onto a compound Poisson process, which was also integer valued. But what about if we got rid of this assumption that the population at time t was integer valued, and we said let's make it real valued, positive real valued. Okay, so it's continuous mass, right? The, the population is some number between zero and infinity, a real number between zero and infinity, rather than an integer between zero and infinity. So I will now define a continuous state branching process to be, it's a, a, a regular Markov process, or strong Markov process, which has the branching property. So I just take the characteristics that I like from the continuous time Galton-Watson process. So think about the fragmentation chain, and then I said, look, fragmentation chains do this. If I take this as a definition of a fragmentation process, then it turns out it contains fragmentation chains and more. Okay, I'm going to do the same, exactly the same uh, uh, trick again. I'm going to say, take what I see from the continuous time Galton Watson process. And what I see is a, a strong Markov process with a branching property, and I'm going to express that like this. So suppose I start with x plus y, thinking integers for now, x plus y indiv individuals, number of individuals. Then what I keep telling you is to see what I've got at time t, well, I just, starting from x, y plus y individuals, it's the same as growing a load of trees with, with one individual and then just looking at the aggregate. I could have also said, well, grow, say, a, a, a tree starting with x individuals and a tree starting with y individuals independently of one, and one another and look at the aggregate and that's the same in distribution as what I would see starting from x plus y individuals, okay? It seems obvious, that statement in the, in the case of Galton-Watson processes when you've got an integer count. So I just upgrade that statement and say, well, let, what the hell, let's, let's have x and y just as positive numbers. And so my definition of branching now means whatever the process is doing at time t, if I start it with x plus y mass, it's going to be the same in distribution as if I started the process with mass x and an independent copy with mass y and I added them together. So the factorization here, you see, is saying that this thing is the sum of that process starting from x plus an independent copy started from y. Okay, that's the factorization is the independent sum. All right? It's a compact way of saying I've got an independent sum. So, if anything lives in there, and we know at least that continuous time got lots of processes should live in there, if anything lives in there, it turns out that if you just go through the steps I showed you with a little bit more patience and a little bit more mathematics, then the same time change, so you use, this should be Z, not Y. Okay, so if you take the process Z, you use the integral of the process Z as a new clock, you take the inverse of the integrated process, and you subordinate Z by that, you get again, not compound Poisson process, but a process which has stationary and independent increments, and that's a Levy process. And in fact, just like this stationary and independent in, uh, increment process, which happened to be a compound Poisson process, this guy was only allowed to have jumps 
downwards of maximum size minus one. Okay, that was the case of no offspring. You could have lots of offspring bringing you an upward jump, giving you an upward jump with any number of, with any integer, but you could only drop down by minus one. So in this story, what turns out to be the case is the levy process that appears through the time change has no negative jumps. This is a little bit a special case of this. So here we have got a negative jump of minus one, but in the, in, in the true continuous state, here we have a discrete state, but in the true continuous state, this thing, when time change, will come out as a levy process with no negative jumps. Okay, and conversely, if you, you give me a levy process with no negative jumps, we make the same time change we saw before. Okay, we take the inverse of this guy here, and we take the levy process time change, but stop it if it goes, uh, if it hits the origin, then you see a CSVP. Okay. Now, I can't describe a CSBP in the same way that I can describe the continuous Golden Watson process. Here I can say hang around for an exponential, have a random number of offspring, each one hangs around for an independent. So I can kind of put building blocks together piece by piece, right? But I can't do that for a continuous state branching process. There's too much happening at once to be able to do that. So the way to describe the evolution of continuous state branching processes is through the semi-group. Now, a levy process is defined, <coughs> is, is characterized through its Laplace transform, or more generally it's through its Fourier transform, but because this is a levy process which has no negative jumps, we can talk about its Laplace transform comfortably, at least for the parameter lambda positive. And there is I noticed some finance people in the room, so you all know this, that the, 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 the Laplace transform of a spectra of, a, of a, uh, a levy process with no negative jumps uh, has this nice levy eto formula, so we levy, levy hinchin formula, we get e to the sum function of lambda times t, we get a factorization, this is a function of lambda and t, we get a convenient factorization uh, in t and lambda if we, if we make an exponential an exponential out of this, or we take log of this on the other side. And in particular, Psi has this nice form, which is the levy hinchin formula. Now, we know that hidden in every CSBP is a levy process of this type. And if I look, if I do something similar, I take the Laplace transform of my CSVP at time t with initial mass x. I'll just define that to be uh, e to the minus some function of theta and x. Now, remarkably, but this comes out of the branching property, this exponent here factorizes as a function of t, theta, and x, so that the x comes out here. Now, why is that? That's, that's because of this property, that if I start with mass x plus y, then what I see at time t is the same as if I started something with mass x, and another independent copy of it started with y, and then I add the aggregate together at time t. So I could also, rather than splitting x, plus, suppose I have something of initially of mass x, well I could break that up into mass x over n, x over n, and so on, so I could break it up into n bits, each bit of, of value x over n. And so what I see at time t can be seen as the result of starting n independent processes, n in the <coughs> independent continuous state branching processes, each one issued from, with mass x over n initially. Okay, so this concept generalizes to, to, to breaking it into n bits of mass. And so, if you take that to the extreme, if you take that idea and, and, and you, you start with an infinitesimally small amount of mass uh, adding up to, to x, then this is partially the reason why you get this factorization of the exponent in x and then the, the if you like, this would be the exponent when you start with one unit of mass. Okay? 
And it turns out that this guy here, we can see the levy process that hides behind this CSBP because the, the UT, I hope that's a T and it's the projector, the UT theta is a solution to this um, differential equation. And there's the psi there of the levy process hiding behind it. Now, I wanted to tell you, just, just for comparison, if you, if you took the Galton-Watson case, the continuous time Galton-Watson case, and you looked at the same object for, for the Galton-Watson case, well, you, you see a typo, right, first of all. So remember, if this is an integer, um, I can start, if I start with mass x, I could state x guys each started from 1, right? So if I computed starting with mass x, e to the minus theta, whatever I have at time t, then this should be the same as starting x guys with initial guy with one initial guy. And adding together the aggregate of those x processes each started with 1 in this Laplace transform would correspond to multiplying each of these Laplace transforms together, start each one starting from 1, x times. So I would end up with one of them raised to the power x. Okay, so that also kind of in, uh, explains why you get this factorization here in the continuous setting, the continuous analog of that. It's not surprising then, you, you're thinking of this somehow as the expectation starting with initial mass 1. That's certainly what we see here. If you imagine the x is up there, sorry about the typo. Okay, rather than writing it as e to the power minus something, I've just kept it as a function of t and theta. Okay, and that's simply because of the way the mathematics works out for Galton-Watson processes, continuous time Galton-Watson processes. So how would this guy evolve in time? Well, it would solve this differential equation. Okay, so where now g is looking like the branching rate, this is the probability generating function of the offspring distribution and then minus s. In, in some sense, this is, I get j particles and, I, and one guy's died. Okay, so an infinitesimal action happens at rate beta. I get j people introduced with probability to pj, but one guy was removed, the guy who died. Okay, this is how this differential equation should be interpreted. So the continuous state branching process is somehow mirroring that, but we get here the, the, the Levy exponent. But again, in some sense, this is also something to do with that compound Poisson process, remember, where the size of the jump was j with probability pj plus 1. Okay, and this would be the case of a jump minus 1. So this is something like, the, this is related to this quantity, but for the compound Poisson process. Now, the reason why I've shown you these semi-group equations um, is because I want to get to super processes in the last five minutes. Just let's scan through this slide. This is quite, this is essentially reaching the story that we, we had at the very beginning, but now for CSBPs. So if you take the average number, the average mass you've got in your CSBP at time t starting from x, well, it's x multiplied by some uh, e to the alpha, some alpha, or it's an a, sorry, e to the a t. Okay, this is, again, in the spirit of what you saw for the continuous time Galton-Watson process, normalize the actual count at time t by e to the minus alpha a t. That's a martingale. And criticality now, well, before we were seeing m to the power uh, n for the, for the discrete time galton watson for the continuous time galton watson Galton Watson, we saw e to the minus beta, or e to the plus, rather, beta m minus 1 times t. So 
Again, this, this mean offspring distribution occurred here. In the continuous mass case, we don't have this, but we have some constant A. A being less than or equal to zero means that our average mass is either dying exponentially or say, staying constant. And A positive means that, that on average we're growing in mass. So, but still, just like the Galton-Watson case, we've got exponential growth, decay or in a positive direction. So subcritical, critical with equality, or supercritical according to the sign of that exponent A. And then we have a slight distinction between, uh, we have a distinction in the, in the way that dying out can occur. So in the continuous time golden watson case, you can die out in only one way. You, you hit zero in some finite time, OK? So you have changes of size. You have changes in the number of people downwards only by one unit, OK? Somebody died and wasn't replaced. So you, you, you jump and you hit zero at some finite time, or you never hit zero. But in the continuous mass case, there's a distinction. So we can have extinguishing and extinction is two different ways of dying out. So extinguishing just says, look, your mass tends to zero. And extinction says your mass has become zero in a finite time. Now, becoming zero in a finite time implies extinguishing. But of course, there's a slight difference between these two events. One is the case that you come somehow come down and hit zero. Now, the other could be this, or it could be that you somehow limit to zero, but you never get there. OK? So it takes you forever for your mass to dwindle down to zero. OK? So there's something that's in between extinction and extinguishing, which is the dwindling effect there. OK? What should we see here, right? So the, there is, you can't have a process. It's not possible to have a process which some of the time extincts and some of the time extinguishes but doesn't extinct, right? You can't do this some of the time and this some of the time. So with probability a third does this, with probability two fifths does this, and for the rest of the time it survives. Okay, you can only extinguish either with the trickle down or by hitting zero, OK? There's no combination of the two. Um, and when you don't extinguish, so when you don't either hit zero or trickle down to zero, you blow up. And of course, you blow up exponentially, right? Now, there's a nice integral test on the Levy process exponent that's hiding behind the continuous state branching process, which tells you when you are doing this, whether you have a process which does this, or whether you have a process which does this on the event of extinguishing. Okay? And it depends on the growth of 1 over psi theta for large theta. Okay? And this is a subtlety which you don't see with Galton-Watson processes, and I'll explain why in a couple of slides, why you get this difference, why you get these two types of dying out. OK, moving on, branching Brownian motion. So come back to this Galton-Watson process here. And what I will add in now is I will say, well, not only are you hanging around for an independent and exponentially distributed amount of time, but I'll let you move around as a Brownian motion as well. Okay? And when you die and you split into a, a random number of offspring, well, those offspring are also going to do independent Brownian motions, but I'll start them from my death point. Okay? So the, the, the easiest thing is to look at a picture. So here we've got two initial ancestors. We move around as a Brownian motion. The exponential clock rings. I die, I have two offspring here, and I start for each one an independent Brownian motion, and off they go again. Each one lives for an independent exponential. This guy's clock rings. In this case, everyone seems to have rather a low number of offspring, two or three. 
He has two independent branding motions and so on. Now, this is akin to a, a branching random walk. So I can describe the process at time t, again, through a <coughs> atomic valued <coughs> random measure. So I have how many particles at time t? I have a golden Watson number of particles, zt, right? Because if I ignore, if I ignore the, the, the movement, then the action at which branching occurs and the number of offspring is precisely the same description as, that, as I've given you for a golden Watson process in continuous time. But now I want to add their positions. I want to say, well, I've got a unit mass at wherever these brown, these, the aggregate of these Brownian motions are. Okay, total mass is a, a, a Galton Watson process of continuous time. Another typo, this NT should be ZT. Here is the martingale, which is the analog of the martingale you saw in Biggins' convergence theorem. Okay, so I take e to the minus, I take the Laplace transform of this random measure, and I reweight it not by m theta to the power n, but by um, uh, I've got the exponent wrong. I'm sorry. It should be e to the minus beta m minus one t uh, minus lambda squared t over 2. I've forgotten that bit there. Okay. So if you're familiar with Brownian motion, then you would know if I took e to the minus, if I took e to the minus Brownian, mo lambda Brownian motion minus a half lambda squared t, you'd say, I know this. This is a martingale. Okay. This is an exponential martingale for Brownian motion. So with the corrected scaling here and the corrected zt there. What this is is a kind of branching Brownian motion version of that martingale. Okay? In essence, let me write the correct formula here. So it should be sum i is 1 to zt e to the minus lambda uh, xit minus, I'll put the half lambda squared t, and then minus beta m minus 1 t. So this martingale is kind of, if I cover up those bits, you see the Brownian martingale. And of course, any line of descent to time t, although there is branching, any line of descent is in, e in effect following a Brownian motion. So it's adding over each particle the Brownian motion from the root until the position at time t. But then, because I'm adding over a Galton-Watson uh, Galton number of particles, I need to rescale by the average number of Galton-Watson particles. Okay? And that's your martingale. And again, the same story that you saw for branching random walk. This, you can check when this thing uh, converges to a non-trivial limit, and you can use that to pull out information about the rightmost particle of your branching Brownian motion. This is my last slide. And then the torture is over for me. <laughs> OK, so I want to remember what I did for Golden Watson processes. I said, look, I want to get this discrete valued object and turn it into a continuous valued object. So I want to have this thing valued in the positive reals, OK? So how about I convert my branching Brownian motion from a discrete object to something which is even more continuous? And the even more continuous version of this would be to say, rather than having it as an atomic valued measure at time t, how about I have it measured, uh, ha have it valued in the space of finite measures at time t? OK, so that's what I'm after. And this is how I can build one of those things. So I'll take some measure mu in the space of finite measures on RD or R or whatever the space you want to work with. Um, this will be my, the initial value of my new measure-valued process that I'm about to construct. 
Okay, I take a branching Brownian motion with an initial number of particles which are scattered in space according to a Poisson random field with intensity mu multiplied by n. Okay, so in one dimension, I'm saying I'm going, I'm going to construct this process that starts with a measure on um, the real line. Let's say that I'm drawing here for you the support of measure mu. Okay, so let's say that mu is the black thing there you see is the support of the measure. Now I use this as an intensity for a Poisson random field. Well, I use this multiplied by n. So, of course, I pick a Poisson number of points according to this measure multiplied by n, and they must lie in the support of the measure mu. That's a consequence of it being a Poisson sample with this intensity. Okay, now from each of those guys, I evolve a branching Brownian motion. Off they go. But the branching rate assigned to each of these BBMs is going to be beta multiplied by n. Actually, I'm going to have beta equal to 1. Don't do this because you'll ruin the board, right? So take beta equal to, uh, take beta equal to, equal to 1. So I'm going to fix the branching rate at n. And I'm also going to assign mass to each individual 1 <coughs> over n. Because in my branching Brownian motion, I'm counting each particle as just one object, right? As one unit. So why not give it a unit of mass 1 over n? I want to end up with a sense of continuum of mass, right? So I've got branching rate n, and each particle is worth mass 1 over n. So if you look at what we saw before in the, in the, the semi-group equation for the continuous time <coughs> gotten watson process, we saw this object occurring, OK? I hope we saw this object occurring. There he is. There he is. There he is. There he is there, OK? So g was the branching rate, and then this was the generator, the generating function of the offspring distribution minus s, OK? So somehow this, was ca this captured all the information we wanted about how to grow the process. We grow it, branching at rate beta. There's the offspring coded in here, minus 1 because a guy dies, right? So in this story here, I want to take my offspring distribution such that this is equal to that, where psi is one of those levy hinchin exponents, right? Now, I've got no linear term on it, but let's not worry about it for now. So you would say to me, yeah, but how do you know there exist probabilities such that all that together looks like that, where psi happens to be that thing there? Well, if you take this function here, it's, all, you know, it's an exponential with one, the first two terms stripped off it. So you write it as a power series, and then you exchange the power series with the integral, and you plug it in there, then you can start to see that there is hidden in here a distribution of PJs. Okay? I'll let you work about it. I'll let you think about that yourself. Okay? So for a very particular choice of PJs, I can make this look like that. Okay? And then what I do is I take limits as n tends to infinity. So as I take n to infinity, the mass assigned to each particle is worth less and less and less. I get more and more particles because I, I've got a Poisson sample of particles with rate mu n, or n mu. Okay. So if you think about it, the mean, the mean number of particles here in any domain, let's say a, would be n mu of a. But each particle is worth 1 over n. So in the limit, or even before the limit, the average mass that I assign to a is just mu of a, at least on the baseline here. Okay. 
Now, it turns out that when I take the limit as n tends to infinity, I branch faster, I give less mass to each particle, I increase the number of particles that I start with, the whole thing converges to something. It converges to what we're going to call the super Brownian motion. And one way to check, I mean, the weak limit, we have to be very careful about what we mean about this because we're talking about convergence of the process as a whole. I'm not going to go into the details. So really what one way to convince yourself is to look at a slide. It's, this is the last slide. So you look at the, the, the Laplace functionals of the super process at time t. So I integrate test functions against this, what would, in the, before we take the limit, we would have the, the branching Brownian motion integrated against a test function. So that would be, so everything depends on t, f of x, i, n, t, right? So that would be the inner product of f with the nth in the sequence of our branching Brownian motions. So take the Laplace functionals of this guy, take the limit, and you will find that you limit to the Laplace functionals of what's going to be our super process. And if we start with a unit mass of x, and we define this exponent accordingly, we find that it solves a P PDE, looking like this. Okay, if we switch off movement, or we don't care about movement, then we're back to the PDE describing the CSBP. Right? Remember, this is exactly the CSBP telling me what the, the, uh, uh, the CS, how the CSBP evolved, which is to say that if I take f equal to 1, the total mass of the super process is a CSBP. So somehow I've built this thing up from... BBMs, total mass of BBM is a, a continuous time Galton Watson process, so not surprisingly, total mass of a super process is a CSBP process. Okay? And here's the branching process, here's the branching property that if I don't start with a unit mass at x, I start with a, a general measure, somehow I see the Laplace functional as an integral of the Laplace functional or the Laplace exponent starting with Dirac mass x against the initial measure mu. So it's somehow representing the idea that I take my measure mu, there's the support of mu here, so a bit here, a bit here, a bit, and I divide it up into tiny infinitesimal bits, and it's as though somehow I'm issuing an, a, a super process of infinitesimally small mass from each point in the support of, uh, of mu, and they're independent. This is what this integral should be interpreted as. Remember, when we, have, when we, we did a com computation here, if we have k guys, we look at the Laplace functional of k guys in a Galton-Watson process. It's like raising the Laplace functional t starting from 1 to the power k. OK, you now know enough to listen to the remainder of the talks. Any questions? Read that bullet point. <coughs> CSBPs either do that, or they have a strange difference with Galton Watts. They trickle down to zero. This is a phenomena which is occurring as a consequence of, if you think about this rescaling, it's also telling you how to <coughs> rescale a Galton Watson process to get a CSBP, because in effect, we're putting an infinite number of particles to start with. OK? So that's where the, the, the different feature comes from. Galton Watson processes start from a finite number of particles. CSBPs, in effect, start from an infinite number of particles. And this effect comes from that, from the fact that you've got an infinite number of particles to start with. I really should stop. Okay, I'm just going to thank you for that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so let's keep going.